Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. We're going to talk about visual physiology in this video, like how do we actually see? So the key is that we have to get, you know, the, 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 the photons of light that are bouncing off the things that we're looking out in the world have to get to our photoreceptors. We have a whole system designed to do that, and then we'll talk about what happens once those rods and cones are stimulated. So the beginning here is light has to be bent. Light has to be bent or refracted as it passes through the eye. So normally when we think about, when we think about bending of light rays, we think of the lens. But about 70% of this light refraction is actually occurring by the cornea and the aqueous humor of the eye. The lens, which is full of these cool transparent proteins called crystallins, it's going to do the rest of the job. It's going to, it's going to finish off the refraction or bending of light rays to focus the image on the retina, on the photoreceptors. And I'll talk in the next video about what happens if, if that doesn't work, where you're going to be nearsighted or farsighted. So the lens's job is to focus a visual image on these photoreceptors. So the lens provides that extra bit of refraction we need after the, 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 the photons of light from the image have already gone through the cornea and the clear aqueous humor. All right, so the, the, the lens will change shape in order to do that, depending on what we're looking at, right? The idea of accommodation, looking at far and near images, it takes a different shape lens to do those things. A flat lens is good for far vision. A more rounded or thicker lens is good for near vision. Okay, so we've gotten the image that, that we're looking at through our cornea, through our aqueous, aqueous humor. Um, gone, it's gone through the pupil, right? That opening, depending on how much light there is. The lens has finished off that refraction, and now, and now the, the signal is traveled through the posterior uh, chamber of the eye, which is full of that clear vitreous humor. So notice the word clear or transparent constantly. Everything has to be clear, or else what we're looking at can't reach these photoreceptors. So here's the photoreceptors. I've already done a separate video on them, but it's big picture. We have rods and cones. Rods doesn't take very much light to stimulate them, but they don't discern color at all. Right? Rods see the world in grayscale, and they're also not very clear. So if you if you're in, in a low light situation, rods are critically important. They'll sense shadows and movement and diffuse edges. You can tell something's there but not exactly sure what it is. Cones um, need a lot more light to work. That's their big downside, but they can see things in colors, right? Using the three different types of cones we have, red, green, and blue, we can see up to a million different colors. Um, and they see clear edges, defined edges. So if you want to clearly see something, it takes a lot of light to, to trigger these cones. And if you don't have the uh, one or more of these cones, you would be colorblind. So you can go back and watch a separate video about rods and cones there. So once these photoreceptors are actually um, triggered, now the visual pathway is going to begin. So the visual pathway begins at these photoreceptors. Now, real quickly, not a big deal, but you notice light's coming from the bottom. Light actually travels through where the ganglion and bipolar cells are to strike the photoreceptors, and then the signal actually gets sent back. It's kind of weird. It's almost like the, the eye is backwards there. But once this message it triggers the photoreceptors, it's going to synapse in two places, from the photoreceptors to those bipolar cells, then the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells. And I, and I covered the two different types of ganglion cells in that rod and cone video as well. So this message has to cross those two synapses. So from the, from the rods and cones to the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells, these ganglion cells are going to collect there and converge on the optic disc, which is called your blind spot because there's no photoreceptors there. And they're going to they're going to travel through the wall of the eye and they'll pr proceed here as you can see as cranial nerve 3, the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is going to travel and it's going to you're going to reach that optic chiasm which is in the diencephalon. So you'll notice there um, that at the optic chiasm, only some of the nerves cross. They, they, they don't actually all cross. So the optic chiasm is where the um, some of these nerves are going to cross. Now, after the optic chiasm, these bundles of neurons are now called the optic tract. This has to do with the fact that the word nerve is used with the peripheral nervous system, tract with the central nervous system. So the optic tract is going to carry information from the eyes to really three different locations. So most of it's going to go to the thalamus, specifically, as you can see here, the lateral geniculate, geniculate nucleus, hard saying one, lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and that's going to be the relay center that's going to send the information on to the visual cortex in the actual occipital lobe. So that's one place it's going. But then more, um, some of this information is also going to the superior colliculus, which helps uh, track movement. So it's how we, we track moving targets, these kind of things. And then lastly, a very small number of these retinal ganglion cells are going to project to the suprachiasmic suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. And that's going to, these These do not actually perceive images. They're photosensitive. They can tell if it's light or not, but they don't actually tell you what you're looking at. So the presence or absence of light is going to tell your hypothalamus basically what time of day it is and how long the days are. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus takes this information and uses it to set your day-night cycles, your circadian rhythms. Now that's great for most of human history. That's great. And I won't go 
go into it all in detail here. But the problem now is we use so much technology and we have so much light that even at midnight, your brain can be convinced that it's noon, right? And that, and that is a problem. Okay, so we've talked about how we've gone from the, the image traveling through the eye to the retina. We've talked about how the, the retina has these photoreceptors that are going to send the signal to the bipolar cells, ganglion cells. They're going to they're gonna leave the eye and become the optic nerve. At the optic chiasm, some of them will cross. We'll talk about why they all don't at the end of this video. Um, most, most of those nerve signals are going to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus where they're going to be relayed on to the uh, visual cortex in the occipital lobe. Some go to the, the colliculus for, to tr for tracking movement, and then some go to this suprachiasmatic nucleus to tell you what time of day it is. But now we're actually at the, you know, the conscious mind here, the visual cortex. So notice we have these what are called combined fields of vision because the, what you're, when you're looking at something, the left side of both eyes are going to send information to the right side of the brain and the right side of both eyes are sending information to the left side of the brain. So you'll notice that some of these nerves are going to cross and some do not. So you see the purple and green here. All the everything you're looking at with the photoreceptors that are that are purple are going to end up on the left side of the brain. Everything that's green on the right side of the brain. So we need two eyes um, to see things clearly because everything we're looking at is actually a combination of both eyes um, looking at them. So some of these nerves do not cross, which is very rare in the nervous system. So why why do we need two eyes? This, this binocular vision. The key is that it gives us our depth perception. Right, the left, the the images that are entering the brain from the left and right eye, we can we can put that information together and figure out about how far something is away. Uh, so I wanted to talk about why does why do images show up in reverse, upside down and backwards? So I've got a picture of Oliver here at his kindergarten graduation. So light from the top of an image hits the bottom of the retina. Light from the bottom of an image hits the top of the retina. Light from the left side of an image hits the right side of the retina, and light from the right side of an image hits the left side of the retina. I think I think I get you get. Where I'm going here. So the image is going to be reversed upside down and backwards because what was on the top of an image hits the bottom of the retina and what was on the left side of an image hits the right side of the retina. So actually my, the retina, at the retina, this image of Oliver is going to look like this. It's going to be upside down and backwards. It's going to be reversed. And you see that with everything. So here we see our, our field of view. So notice that the image striking the retina is reversed upside down and backwards. Your brain has to take all that information using both eyes, and it has to it has to figure out what's coming from the left visual field and right visual field, and it turns it into a picture that we can see. And then your brain will integrate that image and, and put the two fields of view together and then flip it back around so, you, so you're seeing it normally. Okay, so that's why images strike the retina upside down and backwards. All right, lot, lots of stuff going on there. I get it. But this is how we see. This is, this is our visual physiology. I hope this helps. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed.